Hi everyone, I'm Gary Norman. I'd like to welcome you to this program. Today, no guests. I want to spend more time inviting members of this audience to share their input on a variety of topics. For example, I'm going to share something from Alternet that I found interesting from Eric Lomas. Eight ways Americans are headed back to the robber bear era. Well, the robber bear era, and that's the swear engines, the hills, the ghouls, the fisks, the Rockefellers, the Astors, the Vanderbilts. What about the rest of us? I'll talk about that. Then I'm going to give you the latest on how a country, an entire country, decided to decriminalize all drugs for 11 years. What do you imagine the outcome has been? Well, the results are staggering, and I'll share them today. Proof positive that genetically modified organisms really are unhealthy. From MMA, uh, from Rodel Press, a Danish farmer has researchers intrigued by reports that his profits and his animals are much healthier after getting rid of genetically modified soy. So we'll take a look at that. Also, the U.S. Drought Monitor shows record-breaking expanse of drought across the United States. I discussed this two years ago. I told you it was coming. I'm telling you now, it's not going away. So for those of you planning on relocating to about 16 different states, better think, because you're not going to have the water. Also today from Kathleen Olian from Rock Center, prescription drug addiction among pregnant women becoming, quote, a monstrous tidal wave. Well, what's anyone doing about that? That means that there are thousands of babies born every year addicted to prescription painkillers like OxyContin and all the others, narcotic drugs. I'll discuss that. The latest on healing, specifically today, I'm going to get into some depth on curcumin and vitamin E and uh, your skin and something is never discussed by your physician but should be. What happens to your nutrition in your body, your nutri nutrient levels, when you take a prescription medication? Well, I'll give you some of the most common brand names like Lasix and Tums and Lenoxin and tell you what it does to the nutrients in your system. You want to have healthier skin? I'll deal with that. Want to help stop inflammation in your joints? I'll deal with that. From Susan, Susan Evans, Kirk Stokel, uh, I have a lot of people who are contributing today. So let us begin. One of the biggest problems in America is high blood pressure. It's a silent killer because very few people actually take the time to have their blood pressure tested, especially blood pressure, blood pressure after you've exercised, maybe a half hour later. Does it return to normal or does it stay high? Your resting pulse, your walking pulse, your jogging pulse, and then your recovery pulse. Does your pulse go from 80 to 100 and then back to 70? Or does it stay high? All these are indicators you've got a problem and you should have it addressed. Most people don't. So I'm going to share with you how, if you have high blood pressure, which most people do, especially those over the age of 55, and you could be one of the people who are dying this year or visiting a doctor. How many people visit a doctor each year because of high blood pressure? 40 million doctor visits per year. And it's something people don't realize. If you have high blood pressure, you're going to have a greater risk of kidney damage and also trouble to your vasculature system. That can accumulate into a heart attack, a stroke, and kidney failure. And we're talking about well over 100,000 preventable deaths per year. So what can we do to drop our blood pressure down and to do it properly? Well, first and foremost, get off all of the animal proteins that help contribute to stress upon our vascular system because of the arachidonic acid, which is a very, very irritating pro-inflammatory 
uh, fat that's inside of the, uh, the animal, especially in the fatty tissue of the animal. So those who are now hip into brain foods and, and uh, all these shows on television uh, getting people excited about the exotic quality of uh, liver and kidneys, understand something. When you're eating these, you're eating the detoxification organs of an animal. An animal who in all likelihood had antibiotics, growth stimulating hormones and pesticides, and genetically engineered food fed to them. All those residues are in the animal's tissue. The other day, someone says to me in the office, you got to watch this. This is this exotic you know, guy who runs around the world eating strange foods. And he was starting off with pig's blood. And then it showed this big uh, kettle of um, the intestines of pigs. And they were boiling it along with some things. And he eats it and says, oh, how good this is. Good, you can't sterilize either an animal's intestines or a human intestines. Even if you have an ozone colonic, you're not sterilizing it. All you're doing is removing the larger pieces of non-digested fibers. You're helping get rid of a lot of the bad bacteria, all of which is good, by the way. I'm definitely in favor of two to three times a year having a really good um, colonic. But, and then if you have juices every day, especially juices that are green with lemon and vitamin C and garlic, you are killing off bad bacteria in the gut and you're lessening any chance of colorectal cancer or any other form of inf inflammation in the gut. But to suggest your gut is clean is an absurdity. So when I saw this person eating this and recommending people eat this, now people are into all this, they're eating feces. That's correct. You're eating feces. There's no way in the world to deconstruct the molecular activity of feces. Heavy metals, toxins, you're going to eat them. In any case, uh, so when people are eating wrong and they're eating these animal organ diets that are hot now, hip, gourmet, I don't care what you call it, it's still crap. It's toxic. It's bad. So what do you do? First you stop it. Then you start to give your body the nutrients that are called functional nutrients. They produce a particular function in the body. Now, top of my list would be a combination of rice, organic rice protein, and hemp protein. The combination of the two together are terrific for the system. And uh, that's the first step. And that way you can eliminate the chicken, the fish, the animal proteins, the dairy, because you don't need them. Also, every time you have dairy, you're producing mucus. Now, in the morning, you'll notice the mucus. You'll clear your throat. You'll clear your nose. It sometimes is in the eyes, the corner of the eyes. Um, that's mucus. And in that mucus are white blood cells. And uh, that's how the body tries to eliminate toxins from the body. So get rid of that, and you're not, no longer stressing your immune system, and you're no longer having allergic reactions. So then it's always good to start the day with a nice glass of juice. And one of the best ways of starting the body with juice and giving yourself electrolytes, because if you do exercise after you have your juice, your body has electrolytes. Coconut water, four ounces, and put in any berry or vegetable powder that you choose. That gives you the full spectrum of electrolytes and minerals necessary to sustain your body's electrolyte activity, especially potassium, when you're exercising because your heart needs potassium. You need potassium when you're sweating. The coconut water gives that to you. And it really helps to get the body started detoxing. Then a couple of nutrients will make a difference. One would come from grapes and the biologically active polyphenols such as resveratrol and proanthocytidins. Those improve your cardiovascular condition and help prevent a heart attack or stroke. So that's good right at the top. So you're preventing a stroke with the grape seed extracts, grape skin extracts, um, and the grape seed polyphenols. That also reduces, now this is important, most people don't realize this. If you have yourself either the grape seed polyphenol 
or grape juice, maybe four to five ounces of good quality organic grape juice, you're reducing the salt sensitive hypertension and that can help lower blood pressure. So that's good. That helps us. And, uh, and then I would throw a th few more things in there. Um, vitamin C is important in lowering blood pressure and thinning the blood and helping prevent blood clots. And also pomegranate. Now, if you have some pomegranates that are uh, fresh shucked and, and put into um, a smoothie, phenomenal tasting, crunchy, good for you, great fiber. And of course, if you don't, then the pomegranate juice or pomegranate concentrate is good. And you could put some pomegranate juice with coconut water and you have a superb athletic drink. In fact, when I go on my power rides, try 60 miles, full gear, full resistance, no changing gears, nonstop. That's a power ride. Well, your, your muscles are going to burn. And to help as your muscles burn and get the lactic acid out, use coconut water and pomegranate juice combined. Pomegranate is great for your heart and for lowering blood pressure. It's rich in polyphenols, and the polyphenols reduce cellular oxidative stress and help restore natural antioxidants to their effective uh, levels that they were before. It combats hypertension. And just like your grapeseed extract, pomegranate extracts also inhibit activity of the anto, it is called an angiotensin converting enzyme, or ACE, helping to lower blood pressure. It also is good at blocking some of the downstream damage induced by angiotensin in tissues vulnerable to hypertensive drugs. And there's even a third way that it's good, because pomegranate supplements or juice can increase levels of an antioxidant protective complex called PON, P-O-N. That stands for para-oxonanase. And uh, there are major components of the high-density lipoprotein with a good cholesterol. And also, they help your vessel wall function. Oxidative damage cause, causes scarring and lesions on your blood vessel walls. Well, pomegranate juice my, uh, migrates and helps improve the damage in, in the endothelial uh, nitric oxide uh, synthase, thus making your blood vessels more more adaptive to nitric, nitric oxide. So all that's good. There's no reason that you should be having high blood pressure at this point. Now let's say that you're taking some medication. Let's say you're taking Flonase, uh, which is used for hay fever and asthma. You're going to deplete vitamin A and folic acid, B6, vitamin C and D and K, calcium, magnesium, potassium, selenium, zinc, and melatonin. But wouldn't it make more sense to deal with your hay fever on a natural level? and not cause these deficiencies? Because if you deplete melatonin, you're going to be fatigued all day. Your immune system is going to be compromised. You're going to be more susceptible to infection and inflammatory processes in the brain. If you're taking lanoxin for a regular heartbeat, you're going to take out thiamine, B1, calcium, magnesium, phosphorus, and potassium. You're going to make yourself more susceptible to osteoporosis. If you're taking lasic, for hypertension, you're going to destroy thiamine, B6, vitamin C, and calcium, chloride, magnesium, phosphorus, potassium, sodium, and zinc. And if you take, uh, if you take Percodan for pain, you're destroying your vitamin C, iron, potassium, sodium. You're going to end up fit with fatigue. You're going to end up with poor blood. You're going to end up anemic. And if you have an upset stomach and you take Tums, you're going to end up with a shortage of iron, mang manganese, phosphorus, and chromium. So I'm suggesting before you take any medication, find out what are the side effects of this medication. Now, over to a comment from Christina Olian. And here's what she says in a short piece on prescription drug addiction among pregnant women becoming, quote, a monstrous tidal wave. I'll quote this. They are the youngest victims of the prescription drug epidemic, tiny babies born already addicted to the drugs their mothers were taking when they were pregnant. 
More than 13,000 babies a year are born in America addicted to prescription painkillers like OxyContin and the hydrocodone and other narcotic drugs. This is according to the Journal of the American Medical Association. The Rock Center visited three hospitals and spoke with doctors. These babies may seem normal at birth, but within days they start having symptoms like severe shaking, tremors, and more. Quote, they vomit, they have diarrhea, they'll often have a fever and sweating, extreme irritability, says Dr. Mary Newport, the director of neonatal unit at the Spring Hill Regional uh, Hospital, North Tampa. The newborns also have trouble sleeping, feeding, and they uh, shriek in pain. Their bodies craving the medication they are addicted to. The number of babies born this way has increased dramatically over the past five years. Quote, it's terrible. We sometimes feel that we have a neonatal drug rehabilitation unit. And, uh, and then it goes on to talk about these experiences. So here is my question. This is not a new phenomena. And only because the Journal of the American Medical Association, which is an official journal, the official journal for all of American medicine, has finally recognized it. Now it becomes real. Yesterday, before this article came out, it wasn't real. So if you were a nurse or a physician, if you were a person working in a hospital and you saw all these babies having all these symptoms, you could recognize them, but you couldn't say that we had a, quote, monstrous tidal wave because it was just your personal experience and observations. Now it's official. Isn't it amazing that nothing ever exists in the United States? Reality only begins upon official recognition of it. So what do we do about it? Well, here's what we're going to do about it. Nothing. Will it change? Not at all. Why? It's simple. Because the doctors who are making these calls to give pregnant women prescription medication, the obstetricians and gynecologists, the pediatricians, those who interface with pregnant women before and during and after pregnancy, they're not exposed to information that would allow them to look at a more holistic birth process. They've already completely trashed nurse midwifery, a legitimate, not just legitimate process of helping and healing a group, but, but actually better statistics, healthier babies born, less problems and complications in pregnancy and deliver. But that's an ir irrespective. That, that, that goes out the window. You're not going to have pharmaceutical companies who place the ads in the Journal of the American Medical Association, all other, all other journals, and advertise on television. You're not going to have them stop recommending that their drugs be given to pregnant women. Doctors are not going to stop giving the drugs either off-label use or label use. So we will recognize the problem and do absolutely positively nothing to change it. Nothing. And yet, here's the irony. And I know this irony is not lost on this audience who are in much more sensitive and keen to these issues. Ask Mitt Romney, ask anyone in politics, senators, governors, president, ask anyone. What would you think of a woman whose baby is born addict and goes to the same drug withdrawal as a heroin addict or a coke addict or a meth addict? That says it's terrible. Then ask, should we allow this or even encourage it? They're all going to say, absolutely not then say, would you be willing to go on the record and fight to have all medication that could cause any adverse effects in the developing fetus removed from the woman and not be allowed to be prescribed? And then suddenly, they'd start backtracking because then they'd run right up against the most powerful lobby, the biggest givers of gifts and jobs after uh, service in politics, the ones who support money for the campaign re-election bids, and then you start getting this spin. So I'm telling you about a monstrous close tidal wave problem that no one will do anything about, and that's unfortunate. Next up, we are 
in the process in this office of pulling all of our producers and all of our editors to finish a film in time for a pushback against the tens of millions of dollars that are being thrown into California to buy politicians, to influence scientists, to get um, prestigious medical schools or research facilities to say there is no difference between genetically engineered food and, and regular organic food. And therefore, we should not label food. But nearly one million people in California, a lot of them, members of this radio audience, listening all over the world, but also living in California, plus our sister station, where I've been for nearly 30 years, every week for six hours on KPFK, signed the petition that now has gotten a vote as a referendum coming in November. It's simple. Should we label genetically engineered uh, foods, yes or no? They're going to say no and try to convince you that we shouldn't. And we are trying to say yes because you have a right to know if your food is. Now, I'm not telling you not to eat genetically engineered food. That's your right. But I am saying before you make that choice, shouldn't you be informed? And part of that information is knowing, is there a difference between genetic and engineered food and, and not? And the answer is there's a big difference, but you won't know that difference reading the major paper, listening to the editorials, listening to the talking heads, because the media is saturated with pro-GMO Monsanto money. They have tens of millions. We have this film, and we're going to get it out there. In fact, I'm filming uh, uh, in two days in Canada. I then jump off for a day to film in India, then back. Our hope is to have this done by mid-September, and then we will show it all over California. And hopefully that will offer some counterweight, since we don't have the tens of millions of dollars, and we don't have the PR firms. We just have very dedicated grassroots support of people who know the truth about genetically engineered foods, have read the hundreds of articles by Jeffrey Smith and Van Denesheve and all the other out experts showing you why it's bad, bad on all levels, and the lies they tell the pro-GMO people. And we have all those on our website and films there as well. This is the latest. This is from Emily Main from Rodell, and here's what it says. Proof that genetically modified organisms really are unhealthy. I'll quote this. Government researchers in Denmark are suddenly paying a lot closer attention to the health effects of genetically modified crops after a Danish farmer um, and published an account of his life in the newspaper, the pig farmer, who reported significant health improvements in his pigs and in his profit only after he got rid of all genetically modified soy from their feed. Now, GM crops are pretty rare in Europe. Thanks to strict labeling laws on packaged foods, customers have largely shunned products that contain the ingredients which have been genetically altered to resist heavy doses of pesticides that are toxic like Roundup and 2,4-D, the component of Asian orange. But livestock farmers do feed genetically modified corn and soy to their animals. Denmark has the highest pig population rates of any country on earth. Now, this, uh, and, and what they found is that it made all the difference in the world. Uh, within, quote, two days of stopping um, his genetically modified soy, quote, diarrhea virtually disappeared in the farrowing house where sows are allowed to feed their uh, piglets. Prior to that, they had to rely upon strong antibiotics. Since the switch, diarrhea in general has become less of a problem. During the worst epidemics, 30% of his hogs had died from intestinal problems. Not now. Um, since the switch, none of the animals has died as a result of bloat or ulcers, compared with 36 deaths from those causes in the previous two years. None of his animals have died as a result of lost appetite compared to deaths from it previously when they were eating genetically engineered soy. The number of piglets weaned per sow has increased by a factor of two. The piglets are stronger. Sows have fewer stillbirths. And he's been able to reduce the hours by 30 hours per month of working with the pigs because there's less of a need for constant cleaning and medical attention. Even with the added cost of non-GMO soy feed, 
he is saving so much money that he is actually more profitable by $42,000 per year. And uh, so that's just one article of one person's experience, but that has gone viral all over uh, the country. And so all these other farmers, cattle farmers, chicken farmers, um, pig farmers, are saying, well, why can't we switch over? Now, of course, for those of us who are vegan, we'd like to switch them complete, but the reality is that's not going to happen. So even if they take that quantum leap from being on the GMO bandwagon to being off of it, that makes a difference. And finally, before we go to our break, two things I thought were very important for us. This is from Samuel Blackstone, a business insider. This is mainstream. Here's what it says. Portugal, Portugal decriminalizes all drugs 11 years ago, and the results are staggering. It says some thought Lisbon, Portugal, would become a drug tourist haven. Others predicted user rates among youth would surge. 11 years later, it turns out they were both wrong. Over a decade has passed since Portugal changed its philosophy from labeling drug users as criminals to labeling them as people affected by disease. This time lapse has allowed statistics to develop and in time has made Portugal an example. First, some clarification. Portugal's move to decriminalize does not mean people can carry around, use, and sell drugs free uh, from police and interference. That would be legalization. Rather, all drugs are decriminalized, meaning drug possession, distribution, and use is still illegal. While distribution and trafficking is still a criminal offense, possession and use is moved away from the criminal courts and into a special court where each offender's unique situation is judged by psychologists, social workers, and treatment is then considered more important than jail. So they're looking at a person using drugs as a person that needs help, not one who needs punished. The resulting effect, a dramatic reduction in addiction with Portuguese officials re reporting that they had 50% less drug addicts and drug addiction in their country. That's 50% -50 over 10 years. And that makes Portugal the lowest in the European Union 27-member country. One more outcome, a lot less sick people. Drug-related diseases, including sexually transmitted diseases and overdoses, have been reduced even more than usual rates, which experts believe is the result of the government offering treatments with no threat of legal ramifications to addicts. So there we have it. Now, as people in this audience know, I am opposed to the use of drugs, any form of drugs, on several reasons, not moralistic. As a scientist, as a public health advocate, as someone who has studied all of the world literature on the impact of drugs in the biochemistry of the brain and the system, and having seen its impact on friends, I know the downside. At the same time, I'm always interested in what, what we do, why we do it, and what we could do that would be better. So if someone is sublimating their angst by overeating, and the outcome is obesity, diabetes, heart attack, or stroke, or fatigue, or social ostracization, or low self-esteem, then I'm going to work as the best I can to help that person motivate to making healthier choices, to deal with the underlying emotional issues from a different perspective. And that's why I've written the books and done the documentaries. I've done over 100 self-empowerment documentaries. In fact, my newest book, which won't be out for a while, it's done. It's at the publisher. Where's my life, dude? It's a 900-page book just for young people to help them better understand some of the issues they're faced with and adults to understand their children better. I believe that looking at all the information that we're a nation that is suffering. The richest are suffering, not in the same way you may anticipate, but you'd, have, you'd be amazed if you came around at midnight when I'm counseling people at night and see how many very famous people that you'd think, what the heck are they doing stupid things, taking drugs, or you know, why are they drinking this way? They've got everything. They're famous. They're good-looking. They got money. They're liked. 
Why? You see, what you see on the outside when you're looking at people or their careers or success doesn't mean that that is translated inside to a sense of wholeness, happiness, joy. And you've heard me say, not as a cliche, but as a real position from where I start all my journeys, you cannot be healthy until you're happy. And hence, working on the happiness equation is equal to working on the health equation. Otherwise, you could take all the supplements in the world and count calories and do your exercise vigorously. If you're not a happy person, you're not going to have an advantage in a longer, more vital life. Those short-term, it may seem so. Remember, short-term, whoever has power in any situation wins, but it doesn't sustain itself. So working on happiness is the issue, and I believe if we as a nation begin to become honest about how our institutions have at this moment, with few exceptions, there are few exceptions, have betrayed the moral connection to all of us. Our religious institutions, where are they leading their congregations in the streets? Where are the, where are the rabbis, the imams, the preachers, the ministers? The nuns. There are a handful, yes, and I commend them. But 99% of them, isn't that an ironic number? The 99% of all religious institutions and people are strictly supporting the most oppressive politicians, the war state. They do not help their homeless friends, their neighbors. They do not stop home foreclosure. They do not challenge uh, the legal process. They do not challenge the lack of constitutional uh, reality. They don't challenge the, the drugging of our children. They don't challenge anything at all. 900,000 doctors. I called them out at Woodstock last Saturday, if you were there. I said, why don't you have the courage to stand up for your patients and natural healing, and you know what causes disease, yet you're not doing a damn thing to prevent this disease, because it would interfere in the paradigm of acceptance and, and comfort that you maintain, even if you fail every patient, you're still rewarded. It takes courage, as many have done, and all have suffered, every single one I know has suffered. When you say this is wrong, how we're treating medicine, the curriculum's wrong. These drug detail people coming in here are wrong. Giving us free gifts are wrong. Restocking our personal pharmacies and our offices so that a drug that costs us 10 cents, we're charging a patient $3 for, and the patient buys them from us instead of going to a pharmacy. That's wrong. Being induced to key, continue giving sick people with, chemo, uh, with cancer chemotherapy, knowing full well there's not a single study in the world that what we're giving them is going to extend their lifespan or improve the quality of their life, but we're going to make $100,000 on this patient personally. That's wrong. Diagnosing babies with bipolar disorder, that's wrong. Giving women synthetic hormone replacement therapy, that's wrong. Allowing diseases that do not exist to become what you're prescribing and treating for, like social anxiety disorder. That's wrong. And when I say all of our institutions have betrayed us, it's true. That does not mean all people in all institutions are accepting the betrayal. We've had whistleblowers. We have those who've tried to fight back. We've had those who wanted to make changes, and almost without exception, they're marginalized and thrown out. No room for those who want to challenge. So my suggestion is when we wake up one day and we're able to look in a mirror and see everything in our lives honestly and non-judgmentally and then ask ourselves, which of these images, my religious institution, my political institution affiliation, my educational institution affiliations, my medical institutions, my financial institutions, my social institutions, which of these are honoring me in that sacred bond that if I give you my trust and I give you my, my vote and I give you my money and I give you my body, will you honor it? And you're going to see, you better find a whole new group of institutions. The good news is there's a whole new group of institutions, the grassroots growing up, that are there honoring. That's why we have solar. 
That's why we have organic. That's why we have raw and juicing. That's why we have naturopaths and holistic chiropractors and holistic massage therapists and, and holistic physicians and holistic dentists like Dr. Amar Gadol and holistic medical doctors. And that's why we have honest journalists like Chris Hedges. Because there are those who say, whatever bond I have with you, I will not use it to exploit you. The consequences and outcome will not be to your detriment. And I defy you right now, in this moment, to tell me how the corporate Democrats and the corporate Republicans are being anything but defiled. Do you think your jobs are coming back? None of them are coming back. Do you think because you've got seniority and you're making 100000 a year and you've got a master's degree from MIT or Harvard and you're an engineer and you've been essential to that company, do you think your job's protected? Why don't you ask the politicians that allowed 8.4 million, 8.4 million immigrants, equally educated, equally deserving of a job to come in from India and South Korea and Taiwan and Russia and take your job? I do not blame them. It is not their fault, but they're working for 40000 You were making a hundred, and you had a retirement. They don't. They don't get anything. That's the deal. So what part of this is coming back? Nothing's coming back. It's not coming back. We have to create new. But this time, at least be honest what you associate with. So your kid doesn't end up with diabetes, and you don't end up as a pregnant woman taking um, Paxil. And your kid's not diagnosed, and you don't end up having to uh, have your kid take a teen screen and then be told that they're pathological. No. We have done just about everything humanly possible to deny truth. But it's catching up with us now. We're imploding. The good news is that tens of millions of Americans, I'm guessing about 30, are shifting their allegiance away from the distorted, perverse, and destructive images of what we hoped for, what we thought would be the right choices because we wanted to believe instead of looking at the truth of what we were getting in return. Now we're far more independent and with that far more progressive, seeking positive solutions that honor us spiritually, morally, and ethically. So we will stand by our neighbors in their hour of need. We will take the least of us, and we will see that every child that we can is fed. We will stand in front of homes that are being foreclosed on. We will not vote for those politicians from the corrupt little town council in New York, the cesspool. We will not vote for the governors and the others who are in the pockets of the special interest group as they smile to us and hold us in contempt because they're fearful that we may have enough control over their future to get them out of office. We will not allow ourselves to back away from the chances to make positive choices. Those are my thoughts. I'd like yours. 888-874-4888. 888-874-4888. And while you're thinking about what you'd like to share and calling us today, no guests today, so I'm having time now. This extra to last 25 minutes is for you. Eight ways Americans headed back to the robber bear era from Eric Lomas from Aldernet. I won't go through it. I'll just give you the titles. I think you can understand what they mean. One, unregulated corporate capitalism creating economic collapse. And by the way, just take a look at the 19th century. Corrupt railroad capitalists created the Panic of 1873 and the Panic of 1893 through lying about their business activities and buying off politicians and siphoning off capital in their own pockets. And railroad corporations set up phony corporations, allowed them to embezzle money from the railroad into the bank accounts. And when exposed, the entire economy collapsed as banks failed around the country. The Panic of 1893 lasted five years created 25% unemployment, was the worst economic crisis in American history before the Great Depression. Then you've got union busting. In the Gilded Age, business used the power of the state to crush labor unions. President Hayes called in the army to break the Great Railroad Strike of 1877, and President Cleveland did the same against the Pullman strikers in 1894. Today, well, we got Barack Obama, and he is on board as busting every union he can, at the same time asking for them to believe in him. Clinton did that, kind of clever. I remember Hillary Clinton running around the country acting like her and her husband weren't responsible for NAFTA and the loss of two million union jobs. What surprised me was not Clinton. What surprised me were union people who knew full well 
of all the jobs that were destroyed because of the World Trade Organization, these treaties, every treaty, and still wanting to believe that the person on the podium in front of them had any integrity left. Number three, in income inequality. Today, we have the highest level of income inequality since the 1920s, and of course, the gap is even getting worse. And number four, open purchase of elections. In 1890, copper magnate William Clark paid Montana lawmakers $140,000 to elect him to the U.S. Senate. And while most plutocrats did not share Clark's interest in being politicians, they ensured their lackeys would serve in office, often by offering corporate stock to politicians. Well, and now we have Citizens United, don't we? And every effort to turn it back at the federal level, killed by Democrats and Republicans. Wonder who's in their future. Corporate America? Yes. Number five, Supreme Court partisanship. It was totally corrupt back in the 1800s. Today, it's totally corrupt. Number seven, voter repression. The Gilded Age saw the rolling back of Reconstruction, with black people unable to vote in the South due to the grandfather clause and poll taxes and literacy tests and the threat of violence. Conservative extremists have chafed as black people voting ever since the Civil Rights Movement ended segregation. But that's all gone, right? We don't have voter ID laws today. We don't have voter uh, roll purging, do we? Yeah, we do. And last, anti-immigration fervor. Mind you, we don't have a problem with 8,400,000 highly educated immigrants coming on special visas to take Americans' jobs. We have problem when they come across the border. About one-tenth that amount. And we help cause the conditions, including NAFTA, that destroyed their economy. Your thoughts. Back in a moment. Please stay with us. I'm Gary Nall. And by the way, we have a lot of new information up on the uh, FDA, uh, illegal activities, so much new information, and it's, 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 it's a metastasized cancer. This is not going to go away in one new cycle. I predict that within a year from now, there will be major arrests and indictments of corporate America, drug makers, the commissioner of the FDA, and finding out new information on her background, and we're going to discuss this tomorrow with uh, with Scott Kahn of the Whistleblower Association. And um, it has not been lost on uh, this audience that virtually all the people who are on their enemies list who are being secretly hacked into are all in the new film. And, uh, and this film has gone viral. The numbers are off the chart. There's a high probability this will be the most watched documentary in American history. Uh, the numbers are just staggering. I mean, staggering into the millions each day. Let's say hello to Steve from Queens. Hi, Steve, and I'm going to go through as many of your calls now as possible. Hi, Steve. Hi, Gary. How are you doing? Great. I agree with your commentary, but the problem is, is that the distractions are so overwhelming that the people can, can't even wake up. No matter how many people, immigrants come to this country and work hard to make a difference, most Americans, Americans that are very lazy, they're, they're lost and they're very distracted. And um, it's unfortunate, but this is the truth. Okay, I, I accept half of your argument. Would you, Steve, please examine objectively the other half again and see if you could have a different perspective. Some Americans are lazy, an awful lot are not. We are one of the most overworked and overstressed populations on the planet. I know people who are working two jobs a day to make ends meet. I know of families that every member of the family is working, and because there's so little money per hour they're given, that even after four members in the family are working, it's still not enough to pay their basic expenses and their debt. So I would offer you an opportunity, if you would please, Steve, just to say 
re see if you can see, from my perspective, that yes, there are Americans who are frustrated, but let us not look at their obesity and their disease, even though it is self-inflicted, as coming from laziness, as much as coming from insecurity and fear, apathy and resignation, a bad, bad choice on sublimations. And do we not have some moral responsibility to reach out to them as well? Even if they choose not to take our advice or learn from us, information and example should still be shared, I believe. Because who knows the day that someone will awaken and want to become proactive in their own lives and take back the power to make healthier choices in their lives. And when you take back the power to make a healthier choice in your own life, aren't you then more likely to see the world differently, more honestly, and then want to associate by helping others as you yourself were helped? So I believe we must always, always remember the least of us and always be there for them in the moment that they do ask for help and respect the boundaries until that time for them to dismiss us, even be angry with us or mock us without taking it personally. Thank you, Steve. I appreciate your input. Flory from Miami. And I'm going to ask everyone if you could just make your statements quick and we'll get through a lot more calls. Okay. Gary, I agree with the thing that you shared about pregnancy. I was pregnant in the Netherlands. They were completely shocked to see how many meds I had during my pregnancy to treat uh, so-called depression. They also told me that in the USA they treat pregnancy as a disease. They, also, they mostly deliver at home with a midwife over there for obvious reasons, and they are totally opposed to the epidural, and I was angry that they refused to give me one. Later on, I realized that nobody dies from delivery pain, and that actually the delivery pain gets the mom closer to the newborn. And I just wanted to share that I agree with all your statements. Thank you, Flory. Dave from Brooklyn. Hi, Dave. You're on the air. Hey, how are you, Gary? How are you feeling? Good. Thank you. Um, I, I've noticed an Occupy tactic where they... Hello? I'm here. Please continue. Okay. I've noticed an Occupy tactic where some of them have joined uh, the boards of certain corporations and they're trying to influence these corporations by becoming these board members, voting on things, um, debating things with some of the uh, chairman, CEOs, and things of that nature. I was wondering what, what your point of view was as, as, an, uh, as a tactic of converting some of these corporations that or Alec or all Alec or no, no just, corporation will ever change. Institutions do not change. The only time that they require any adjustment is when they're forced through public relations campaigns to show a more humanistic or positive side, in which, came, which case then it is all superficial and is non-real. I would rather see energy put into supporting authentic companies. One of the reasons that we are not growing in the United States is because we're not giving the money to new IPOs, new vigorous companies that when funded with good projects then could employ a whole new generation of people, young and older, and that has stopped. It's about 95% gone. And so supporting new businesses, I believe that if we were to give zero interest loans, with no payback on the, uh, the loan for two years, providing that each new employee was given a living wage and health benefits, and you had to make things in your community, and you could not uh, bring in outsourced materials, made, grown, produced in the USA, you could have a renaissance. And my estimates, you could get about 9 million new people in the United States working at a living wage. That changes the entire economic dynamic of our society. But we're giving zero to these people. We're giving it only to the major corporations, the very ones you're suggesting. The person goes in and argue with someone, and they'll give you a chance to argue, just like an open city council that's already made up its mind how it's going to vote. But they'll give you a chance. They have to. But don't believe that because you've gone in and brushed the blood out of the shark's teeth that somehow they become a salmon. Thank you for your call. Let's say hello to Paul from Staten Island. Hi, Paul. Dear Gary. We have to go back and research why Jefferson changed the uh, the 
the, the, the right of property to the pursuit of happiness because I find that the property and the mortgages are the main source of debt peonage that is creating the feudal system. And, and number two, I want to say the main, why the mainstream religions don't challenge the banks is because they get a lot of funding from them. They don't they, challenge the banks. They don't challenge the war. They don't challenge the inequality. They don't challenge the electoral process until such time that they vote for third-party candidate or by defiance show that they're voting for no one. Then they are not using the power that they have and the underlying spiritual message of moralism that they have abandoned, with some exceptions. Thank yes, you. Yes, We're just going to take one more here. Uh, Michael from Connecticut. Hi, Michael. Hello. Hi, Mike. You're on the air. Uh, yeah. so, you sorry, you're not talking. We'll go over and say hello to Luann Panessi. Hi, Luann. Hello, Gary. Well, boy, speaking of uh, <laughs> speaking of uh, authentic truths, there's an uh, there's an article that I found that I think we that I would love for you to address. There is a quackbuster named Stephen Barrett, and I know for a fact that he's been trying to kind of like smack you down um, ever since I became involved in this field of, of natural approaches uh, to illness and living a healthy lifestyle. This was back in the early 90s. And boy, anytime I Googled your name, there was a whole bunch of, of stuff, attacks about your credibility and about how unscientific you are and that anyone who's, you know, who tries to, uh, to buy into what you're saying it, you're just unfounded, biased, and all this other stuff. Well, very, very interesting. When you actually look behind the curtain and you look at this guy, Stephen Barrett, first of all, there was a study done. There were two people who just give their initials that did a, a very specific study. They wanted to look and see. Because even today, Gary, if you go up on Wikipedia, no matter how much you refute what they write about you, and not just you, anybody in the field of alternative medicine. If you're on their quack busters list, you can't change the Wikipedia information at all. Wikipedia is so, corrupt organization. I'm doing a whole expose on it. They deserve to be brought down because they're a front for the pharmaceutical industry. And I tried to sue Stephen Barrett, but unfortunately, by the time I found out what he had written, the statute of limitations passed. But all the, all the statements that he has made, and I've asked him to debate me. He refuses. His partner debate, debated me, Victor Herbert, Dr. Victor Herbert. That was a mistake for him on national television. <laughs> he wouldn't do that again. But uh, he has a right to his opinion. I'm not challenging his right to his opinion, but he has no right to the facts because he doesn't have any. Make your point. The point is this. He, he's, this is a retired psychiatrist. Don't attack him. Then you're engaging the same... No, no, I'm just making a statement. He's a retired psychiatrist. He's been adopted by the mainstream media as a consumer watchdog. That's correct. The good news here is that these two gentlemen who did independent research on your work says that they conclude with absolute proof of an outstanding educational background and his extensive clinical experience at Gary Knowles being attacked for what he represents, a viable challenge to the existing medical paradigm. Send me a copy of that, would you? How many pages is it? The actual article is, is five pages. However, all of the proof comes out to, you ready? 67 pages of utter proof of all the work that you're doing. All right, well, that's nice to know. Romans, look, the people in this audience have already been down this path many times. Someone makes an allegation, we put, present the evidence. They have allegations, we have evidence. But the mainstream media, the pharmaceutical industries, the people I uh, challenge in my documentaries and investigative report, of course they're going to fight back. They're going to use any technique they can. And now we're seeing from all the dirty uh, stuff that the FDA did, it's all going to come out. And we're going to find out what relationship any of the people writing articles and attacking others had in this whole nefarious affair. But at the end of the day, court in California, Stephen Barrett was shown not to be an expert and he was discredited. It's a matter of official legal record. But again, uh, it doesn't matter. When you need someone to challenge, 
You'll use anyone. When you need information, you'll throw anything you have. But every single statement we make, every article, I've never had to retract a sentence out of 653 articles, 101 uh, books, and uh, 114 documentaries and films. And so, you know, the people want to know what we're about will listen. Those who want to believe that um, everyone, every holistic chiropractor, medical doctor, nurse, um, dentist, all the people are doing good work and have. If they don't want to believe that we have any legitimacy, then any proof at all will not be enough proof. It's that simple. I do not have a problem with anyone writing or discussing anything they wish, but if they want to come on and debate, I give them a forum, and uh, we give them an opportunity to come on and share their points of view. As I debated Brian Deere for an hour, who attacked Andrew Wakefield, we don't have a problem inviting a forum, but these people will never come on the air. Never because we would show them for what they are. But they'll still be used by the official sources. But then again, the official sources, like the New York Times, weren't they the ones where we were telling you that uh, Curveball, the Judith Miller source out of uh, Cheney's office, was a plant, um, and not to believe in any of the pro-war um, drumbeats, weapons of mass destruction were all fraud. New York Times was supporting it. So the official record has been officially wrong so many times, and they will never challenge those who represent their future financially. But people know that. This audience knows that. There are no secrets there. Anything else? Yes, yeah, speaking of official truth, as I recall, over three years ago, I was listening to one of your shows, and you were talking about the fact that we were going into a severe drought the United States. Now, of course, people laughed. They put up water parks in places like Arizona that already had no water in the first place. In Phoenix, yeah. Right. One of the largest water parks in America, yeah. Thank you. And people kind of like, yeah, yeah, he's in another one of those fatalists. Well, here we are, July 18th, 2012, right here. Worst U.S. drought since the 1950s threatened to drive up global pr food prices. Now, over a 1,000 counties have been declared disaster areas by the U.S. Department of Agriculture, more than half the land surface of the country, making the drought officially the largest disaster on record in the country. More than two-thirds of our country, Gary, is experiencing drought. So you are spot on. Water is going to become the new commodity. Water and good land. Here's what you haven't been told yet, but I will share this with you today. Because of commercial farming practices by Big Agra and the excessive use of nitrogen-based fertilizers and genetically modified monocrops, a single crop planted year in and year out with no rest of the soil, we now have a great dust bowl forming, a dust bowl that will exceed the 10% dust bowl in the 1930s. That was man-made. This is also man-made. There are 15 states currently that I am predicting will not be sustainable in the future, including one half of California, the bottom half, New Mexico, Arizona, Utah, Colorado, at least half of Colorado, and also uh, Oklahoma, uh, South Dakota, and Nevada, and half of Texas, and also northern Florida, Alabama, and half of Georgia. So you got to know that it's only going to get worse, not better. And now here's the good part of this story. It gives those who are interested in homesteading and a movement back to the land an idea of places they could go and start to look at growing foods, hydroponically, greenhouse mainly, and where you are going to have soil, building the soil up again, using biodynamic and natural and organic methods, and growing orchards, and having uh, fruit and vegetable gardens, and microgreen gardens, because we're all going to have to eat. And if you have a piece of land that is fertile, and you have good quality mineral water, then you don't have to charge exorbitant prices for your foods. So therefore, you can be a counterbalance to the hyperinflation in milk products and meat products, because they feed the cattle for meat and milk, uh, corn and soy. So first, it'll help a lot of people start to shift over to a meatless diet. That's good. It'll help take a lot of those farms that have been commercial 
and and reckless and get them out of this uh, get them out of the cycle that's good it'll cause a lot of uh, regular farmers to look at organic farming because it's a better and more sustainable model and it'll help people realize that there's going to be more jobs available on farms and farming than any other single part of the United States economy in the future so if there's one place I would put my money it's on quality sustainable farmland within three hours of the metropolitan area so you can get your crops to market and have a quality of life and do it with yourself and other people so today's drought is going to be tomorrow's dust bowl you're going to see massive migrations not only cities going bankrupt but cities having to move people out of their communities or they cannot have enough water to supply the people's needs industry needs and farming needs so that's what's going to happen and we're talking about in the next three to five years not the distant future so I'm suggesting people start looking for quality land where there's water soil now in the sustainable areas of America thank you Luann for your input okay. I'm Gary and I want to thank you all for listening I uh, hope you have a wonderful day and now on the Progressive Radio Network Mike Fader coming right at you PRN.FM, bringing you new shows and fresh ideas every day. The Progressive Radio Network is moving forward, and we hope you're coming with us.